Today's episode of the Four Seasons of Film podcast is brought to you by Phil's Coffee. Phil's specializes in handcrafted coffee made one cup at a time. Visit a location today or find them on the web at philscoffee.com. That's Phil's with a Z, coffee.com. Find the beans you're looking for. It's the Four Seasons of Film podcast. I'm Nathan Robert Blackburn. With me, as always, is Andy Pesha. See that timing? It's that timing of a great host and producer. Oh, yeah, man. I was trying to, well, I was getting my quote ready, you know, so I didn't know what, what to do. I was, I was in a complex situation. Throw it out at us. Come on, let's hear it. I want to hear, hear this illustrious quote this week for our first three-peat episode. I like you, Lloyd. I always liked you. You're always the best of them. Best goddamn bartender from Timbuktu to Portland, Maine, or Portland, Oregon, for that matter. Yeah, so I, like I said, it's our first three-peat episode, meaning we're going to cover three movies this week, which seems like sort of a, a tall order or, or a long haul, but um, I figured it's Veterans Day, so we have to cover Midway. It of came course. out today, basically. Yeah, right. <laughs> it well, should have. For the weekend. You yeah, know, and it won the weekend, too, so that's really, that's really awesome and important to me, being such yeah. a big... Uh, movie fan, but also a big World War II and history buff. I would say I'm a filmmaker, but I'm a buff of two things, World War II and uh, history. Um, but Midway is the uh, World War II movie that we're talking about that we'll cover this week. And also, we're going to do a, a quick review of Timothy Chalamet's new movie, The King, which is on Netflix now. And also, Crap Night is covering a movie that I... I'm excited to hear about. I want to oh, yeah. hear about Dr. Sleep. I want to hear what happens to... Uh, it's not little Timmy... Danny. Little Danny. Yeah. Danny. Danny boy. Danny! I know, right? Yeah, I can't wait. That's yeah. going to be fun. So let's jump right in. Midway, is, it's Veterans Day. So to all yes. our veteran listeners out there, thank you for your service. We love you. Thank and, you, thank uh, you. We support you 100%, as do you to us sometimes on Twitter. Midway was a movie that I wanted to see because um, I've studied World War II for a long time. It just fascinates me, especially on Veterans Day when I'm thinking about my two grandfathers, one of which was an infantryman in World War II in Germany, and then the other was a uh, fighter pilot yeah. in Africa. Oh, nice. So, of course, um, the Pacific Theater, and from this this movie's point of view, it takes place a lot in the air, because it's mostly the air and sea battle of Midway, which was kind of a turning point for the Pacific Theater in the war. So, I'm a sucker for war movies. Some people like westerns. You know, there's people that like genre movies yeah. like that. They, they're all about westerns. They've seen every western. I have seen every World War II film oh, that yeah, I can I think have. of in history. You know, the bad ones, the good ones, they're, they're, it runs all over the place. And there's no bad ones for me because it's just, it takes you back to the world. And if you learn yourself something, then it's a, it's a great thing. Yeah. You know, and what I will say that the as time has caught up to films portraying reality, the World War II films are a lot better now because it's not John Wayne and they all sail off into the sunset together. Yeah. The hero doesn't always have to win. If people died during the war, it feels like we'd be a, doing a disservice to them not to show how. Yeah, they went through that. They lived, well, they lived and died through that, you know? So it's, you can't do it justice without doing it. So Midway was the battle of Midway, which was kind yeah. of this Midway point between us and them, yep. meaning the, the Americans and the Japanese. And the whoever controlled the Midway point in the sea was going to control kind of the Pacific theater of the war. Uh, it was a big, it was a big deal and so this battle, especially right after the response from Pearl Harbor, especially our response to the Japanese, had to be something that would boost morale again. Because for the first time in our history, somebody, a foreign entity, had in, had basically attacked us and won yeah, yeah, that got, battle. Yeah, got one up on us. Yeah, so we weren't feeling really good as a country. And to have a, a battle like Midway turn the tide... I always find it difficult when you're up on a topic like this, like history, especially in World War II history. I know it's going to happen. Yeah, but it's the details, right? Yeah, it's the details. But Roland Emmerich directed this. And you know Roland Emmerich because you're a huge fan of his movies. Yes, I am. And you are a huge fan because what did he direct without looking look, look me right in the eyes? 2012. And? Uh, I mean, he also did... Uh, in Independence Day. There you go. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I, did he do the second one? No, right? 
I think he did. Oh, fuck. Okay, yeah, the second one. That's three right there. Boom, three, Pete. Uh, the Day After Tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the Godzilla would... remake, that that one that wasn't for me. He is a, he's an epic filmmaker. A, you know, a, a, he's like David Lean. If David Lean loved CGI, famous story from film school was, you know, one of the uh, producing teachers said, what do you think of the movie Independence Day? Do did, did we do we like that movie? We don't like that movie. And only one or two hands shot up. And it was sort of that film school snobbiness of people were like, oh, that's not a real movie. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like it sounds like Martin Scorsese right now, but <laughs> <laughs> right? but Midway, I was shocked that he that Roland Emmerich made this because yeah. it, historical drama and epic. And you know, he actually did a movie about Shakespeare. That's so funny that I'm gonna bring this up. It's called Anonymous, and oh, it was yeah. about it was about the guy that um, I think I saw part of that. Yeah, it was about the guy that supposedly wrote all of Shakespeare's plays for him. Um, played by the amazing Reese Ifans. He is he's one of he's, he's such an underrated actor. I love that guy so yeah, much. He's cool. But that movie actually was very good. I really liked that movie and I saw it a couple times because the idea that the bard's words weren't written by him was always a myth. And then he made a movie about that where sort of this this prince kept giving all these great plays to Shakespeare and going, "You you be famous cuz I my I basically I be dethroned if yeah, I right. if, if, if anybody knew hands. I was doing playwright. No, playwriting was such a thing where it was just looked down upon so much. You being yeah. an actor was just you were a piece of shit. Yeah, of course. So get a real job. You what bum. do you mean? Of course. Well, that's how. Yeah, it was of back course. In, yeah. I, well, no, because that's how history was. I'm not saying it's right. Well, but. you could yeah, podcast. Welcome. Words matter. So what is it? So what is it about? It's about Midway, dumbass. I know about Midway. <laughs> I know about the Battle of Midway, but what's the movie about? The movie kind of follows the journey of the airmen and the people that worked on the aircraft carriers and the battle destroyers. And it's in that weird way. I know you've never seen the movie The Longest Day. No, I haven't. It was a great movie. I think it's back in the 50s. I'm going to say 53, but while you look that up and tell me I'm wrong, I'll tell you a little bit about it. It was a movie that was made not too far after World War II ended. And it was so unique for me because it's one of my favorite World War II movies because for the first time, it presented all sides of the war during, and it was about the Normandy invasion. Yeah. And it did a little bit on the Americans leading up to the invasion. Then it cut to what the uh, what the Germans were thinking and doing before yeah. the invasion. Then it did, uh, you know, what uh, the Japanese were doing around the invasion, what all the allies and all the evil powers were doing. And it was called The Longest Day because... Yeah, it came out know, in 62. 62, okay, yeah, 52, 60, whatever. With it. so that, and that's also interesting, too, because 62, for that kind of movie, that's, it was such an epic film. So, so uh, if you know, you were supposed to do Essentials, so would that have been, like, the Essentials for this movie, The Longest Day? Yeah, because it was the most... It was the movie that reminded me the most of this movie, Midway. In a nutshell, people need to give this movie a break. The reviews I'm reading, they're really harsh on its cheesiness, on the visuals, all the things that... You know, I would, if you, if you asked me something negative about the movie, I had to say. Yeah, what would that be? It would be it it would be kind of that like the schlockiness and and the visual effects. They're 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 pretty bad. I yeah. mean, it looks like people floating in front of a green screen with with fire and shit going off in the in behind them. Yeah. But at the same time, because it was a real battle and, and because it involved the real people from the battle and it showed multiple sides, I love that movie. Letters from Iwo Jima. Yeah. Because that was the first time somebody really made a movie that hit the mainstream that was from the Japanese point of view, from the taking of Iwo Jima. And Clint Eastwood directed that. Yep. And then he did the other movie, Flags of Our Fathers, from the American side of it. So that really was shocking to a lot of people back then. Yeah. Because it's it's tough when you humanize people that were, went, especially during the war, they were demonized to your side so much. So, you know, 70 years removed from that, I think we've gone a long way in terms of knowing that there were reasons for people to fight this war for evil. And there were people that did that. And then there were also people that just were in a uniform and had pride of their country and didn't see all the shit behind the scenes, right. you know, or they had a gun to their head and they said, get on the fucking train or, you know, um, I'm going to kill all your family members. Yeah. So good. you're basically signed up in service. Mm -hmm. um, and I was always seeing all those sides when I was growing up studying this war going, holy shit, just like a farmer from the middle of nowhere. What, what the hell does he know about what's going on? You know, he sign sign up you know you don't want anybody dying in your family and on the american side it's like country was bombed country was attacked the whole world's under attack sign me up yeah so in that way i really liked this movie because it presented all sides and then 
the schlockiness and all that kind of stuff that the dialogue is like really cheesy, but I liked it. I like it. It, it yeah. earns its cheese. It, it, it earns its place in that weird way where it is kind of a John Wayne movie. You're like, that guy's the cowboy. And it just, they just said he's a cowboy in the dialogue. So it was fun. It was yeah. fun to watch and it was intense and it was sad. And when you think about all the people that died during the movie and in the battle and, and, the, and the wives back at home, the family members, it's an important movie for people to see. And I'm glad that it, I'm shocked at it, that people were still interested enough to see it and wins a weekend. Um, because it seemed like it was, it's just a small World War II movie, but it is pretty epic. Yeah. You know, I, I like they, it. They spent like a hundred million dollars on this. And I'm, I was kind of shocked because I, a World War II movie with a bunch of battle scenes like this, you don't think this would be a, a hard green light, especially when there's not really like big stars in this. Yeah. I mean, Dennis Quaid's like the biggest star in this. Uh, Manny Moore is in it also. I saw Patrick Wilson was in it. Patrick Wilson. He's like, he's probably the star behind the scenes. But everybody is really fantastic in this movie because they're just so real at the characters that they portray. And especially the lead, the main fighter pilot, his name's Ed Screen or Scrine. And oh, he played Ed Ajax in Deadpool. That's how you'd know him. Yep. Yeah, that's how I do. <laughs> and if in and, and um if Beale Street could talk, he played Officer Bell in and that was last year's movie, and he was insanely intense in that. Yeah. He played sort of this like racist cop who, you know, could fuck with you. But would I like it? <laughs> I I was trying to see if I would like it. I was trying to ask you before and see because I wanted to go see it. it. The previews got my attention. I thought it looked like a better, like a better like Pearl yeah, Harbor. Yeah, you like it to sit on you know to sit on your bed and watch it for a Saturday afternoon. It's fun, you know. It it invigorates my interest because, like I said, I know a lot about that era and it and it was it was portraying seemingly accurate facts about the battle. You yeah. know, all the way down to like the the distinguished cross medals they all wear and shit like that. I love that. You know, the insignias on everybody's lapels. But also, it's just a good melodrama of an of a, of a World War II movie like the old ones used to be, but also a little bit more graphic and updated for our time. So it's a movie, not a film? or It's a right in between. It's Because it was directed by Roland Emmerich, and you definitely could tell this was the guy that made 2012. Okay. A little bit. Nice. It's so important and so heavy. And on Veterans Day, seeing it on Veterans Day, that was the best move I made. Yeah. That yeah, really was. All right. Let's switch it up and talk about The King now. And uh, I want Andy to be brutally honest about his experience watching this. Okay. This movie was endorsed to me by a lot of people. Me and the, too. And The King was, it's of course on Netflix right now. It's starring Timothy Chalamet and uh, Robert Pattinson. Yeah. Team, <laughs> you're a Team Edward fan. I think it's like Team Wolf. They should do a Teen Wolf remake with him. Yeah, I think he would do, do he well. He still there. looks young enough to play it. But seemingly, I had no idea what the movie was about. I thought it was going to be about the land grab between the Scots and the English people. Yeah, me too. Um, but it was not. No, no. <laughs> it, it was, and, and actually, when the movie started, you told me that's what it was about. Yes, I did. I was misinformed. That's what I, I somebody recommended that movie to me, and that was their explanation. So it's like, why are you going to, it's like, you're a way off, buddy. <laughs> you know? I, I mean, they weren't way off. It's just that the land was way off. It, like, yeah. it was between the French and the English. So right? it was like, yes, you got one country right. Yeah. But that's kind of a big deal. Yeah. Because the, the, England and Scotland and England and France, they have, England just pissed everybody off. Of course. They were, you know, <laughs> they were trying to take over everywhere. But after you watch this movie, it is sort of like, ooh, England. Yeah. Especially <laughs> if what they, I don't want to, don't give it away. But, but if, if it's true what happened, I, I still haven't fact checked it, but it would be like, I would that's love, fucked up. I, that's that's fucked my up. biggest, my biggest comment on The King is I need to fact check this movie. Yeah. Because there's a lot of shit that happened in the movie. And by the way, I really enjoyed the movie. It was really gritty and really uh, raw, the way they showed the battle scenes. I haven't seen battle scenes like this yeah. since Braveheart, you know? And Braveheart, in that way where they, they used to give filmmakers more money and bigger sets and wider space to do battle scenes. Yeah. This one was almost Braveheart good. Yeah, from what I saw of it, the battle, the battle scenes were, it, it did remind me of a lot of like those old time movies like it was just so much going on like the mayhem like it, it puts you like you were right there like a lot of the other movies do what once you once you tell us what it's about now because okay. uh you told me it was about something different when i sat down to watch this movie yeah okay um this is the so it's a should i just read no no i want to hear what you think it's about okay, perfect. and then tell me about your experience watching it okay well all right yeah it's about um how uh king henry the fifth comes into the throne and the feud between France and England over over land, 
and he's still dealing with the Scots and his brother was fighting for the throne too because his dad had to passed away so they had to be a successor okay so he's only dealing with the Scots in like the first five minutes of this movie yeah it was like 15 minutes yeah, 10 minutes, 15 <laughs> tops but um, you didn't really watch this movie so much as you ignored it tried to fall asleep and then took a break to go down to, and get in the hot tub outside the studio and then came back Boy, in and then started doing the dishes <laughs> And sat down and said, did I miss Robert Pattinson? You're kidding me. Yeah, well, I didn't And then the movie was over and you literally said nothing. So I don't want to pretend like you you have an opinion on this movie. I don't. But this is literally how it is to watch a movie with you. Okay, I, I didn't know we were going to be doing it for the podcast. I thought this was a leisurely... Which meant this is what makes it more inappropriate. <laughs> this is your behavior on watching just a movie. Any movie, unless it's for the podcast, you don't give a shit about it. And I'm telling you what, you missed a pretty damn good movie. I bet I, I was intrigued from what I saw. Tell the truth. Just tell the truth. No, you are lying. No, I did. You are lying to our up, listeners. I, it picked up once the battle scene was over. I mean, yeah. How they, the fuck would you know if it picked up? Because I caught it in like the three acts, man. I didn't know what was going on. You saw 15 minutes of this movie, no, guaranteed. More than, more than that. I watched you were the last asleep 45. with your eyes open. I was still listening. Still listening yeah, to this movie? Listen, yeah. Oh, Lord. Well, I mean, there was extenuating circumstances. I was very hungover this day. And uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, come, no, the plot thickens. So, you know what? Whatever. Timothy Chalamet is really good in it. You know, he's a very talented young actor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's obviously like the it young actor of this century. Yeah. So, you know, the the thing with him, I think he's underutilized in, in the roles that he's not, not the ones that he's given. It's just he's. It seems like he uh, he has two notes. Either he's yelling or he's angsty. Yeah, no, and I, I think there's a whole lot to impress upon in the middle of that as an actor. Well, maybe. Uh, do you, do you think it's because they don't give him the room? Is that what no, you're saying? No, I think he's he's choosing his projects. But somebody that's like a great screenwriter or a great director needs to come and be like, hey, do this, okay. do this project. You know what I mean? Because I've seen his, his his stage work. He's amazing on stage. He's been really good, like in the bit roles, like in Lady Bird, he was really good in that. And then he was really good in that, uh, where he played the drug addict last year. Oh, that was a really good movie uh, too. Uh, Beautiful Boy. Beautiful Boy. But even Call Me By Your Name, which is probably his best film, he's either very cocky, confident in the movie as his character is, or he's angsty and sad because, you know, he's going through that first love you yeah. know, kind of thing. And then Robert Pattinson, I actually really liked his performance in this. He, he did an bit. accent. Yeah. Just don't even talk. Okay, I saw a little bit of it. Uh, he, was, he did this weird French accent, but it kind of worked because it's like that old school French accent. But his accent was sort of like Willem Dafoe's in The Lighthouse. It was like, is Peg Leg Joe really doing this? Yeah. Like, he's really going for this Long John Silver thing. And Robert Pattinson did the same thing as the, uh, he, he was the Dauphin, so he wasn't the, he wasn't the king of France. He was the king of France's son. Oh, and by the way, also, uh, what's his name? Joel Edgerton was the coolest. He's one of the coolest fall staffs I've seen since uh, Orson Welles played him in Chimes at Midnight, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. Orson Welles also directed that movie and starred as fall staff. That is a fantastic movie. Okay. And I urge you to check that out so you can fall asleep to that. Perfect. Mm -hmm. But Edgerton played a fall staff that was very much, from the scene that involved him in the inn, the set design was directly staged and and ripped off from Chimes at Midnight in okay. a good way because it looked like the exact same set in the same way where you're, oh, they're doing their due diligence here. That's good. And then Edgerton plays sort of this like jovial fall staff that he wasn't as fat as Orson Welles. So that's what I kind of attribute to him putting on the, the he went out to battle. Yeah. And, and Orson Welles was actually too big. You, didn't, you would never buy that in that movie that he went out and, you know, got into a battle. Was he supposed to, though? I don't know what liberties they've taken with the story of Henry V here. Because I know my Shakespeare, and I love Olivier's version, and I love Kenneth Branagh has a version also of Henry V, and that one is actually badass, too. That's all Shakespeare, and Shakespeare also dramatized a lot of history. Of course. He was closer to it in years than we are, so maybe I, you might want to take his word for it a little bit, but he's still a playwright. Yeah. You know? But it reminds you of... In, I, I'm going to speak your language. It reminds me of Braveheart. Okay. And Braveheart's like one of your favorite movies. Yeah, I love Braveheart. Just visually for me, Braveheart's such a badass movie. Oh. It just seems real. There's so much cheese in Braveheart, but then the battle scenes happen and the drama happens, you forgive all the cheese. Yeah. You're like, the cheese intense. actually makes the movie. You're like, I need a little bit of, you know, air let out of my tires. Yeah. Because Jesus. Oh my God, yeah. Shit was serious back oh, then. Oh, I know. It's so, so, so bloody. Yeah, I can't really comment on the movie. I only watched, uh, I think, probably. Say something positive about it. Um, the battle scenes were cool. Okay. 
uh, negative was. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I didn't even bring up negative. Well, you just, just getting like, it out of the way. I just. I, I said one thing. Can I go to the negative now? Yeah, there was just like for for when they were talking, it just sounded it sounded uh, one note, pretty monotone. I gave you the I gave you the, the term one note for this podcast. Okay, well you can't use one note. You got to use something else. Um, they talked a lot. Yep. <laughs> It's a movie. I know, but way too much. You could have fucking screenwriting dialogue. I, I could have cut a half hour of this movie. Go see The King. Watch it on Netflix. I don't think it, it I think it's showing in a couple theaters, but see it. It's a it's a good movie. It's epic. The Chalamet fans will be happy. The Edgerton fans will be really happy. The scenery, the Braveheart fans will be even more happy. And then the morons of the world, like my friend Andy, will not be happy. Unless he only watches 30 minutes of this and does the dishes and, and goes in the hot tub. Tough life, man. <laughs> Let's move on to Crap Night. Will you go see Crap Night with me? All right. So it's time for, for my favorite segment, Crap Night. We brought it back last week where I get to go see uh, the movie that wins the box office. This week, though, it, it wasn't the box office winner, but it was one that, you know, we I wanted to see. I know, Nate, you wanted to see it. Don't bring me into this. Or well, you're going to be brought into no, it. No, we're talking about Dr. Sleep. I want to I want to hear about this, actually. Yeah. And I really don't care if you spoil it, but we're not about spoilers. No, no, I don't, I'm not going to. I don't have to spoil I, you know. Is it a spoiler heavy movie? No, no. I, yeah, can I wouldn't get, think I can it's get, pretty straightforward. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, I'm not going to spoil it. Yeah, right. So, it, it, you know, the movie does. I've been looking forward to it because everyone knows this is the sequel to The Shining. Well, now they do. Yeah. Yeah. It's the sequel to Shining. I mean, the book came out like. In the last like 10 years, though. By Stephen King. Yeah, by Stephen King. He's like, what's going to happen? And so it takes place. Um, some scenes do go back to the original events of the uh, first Shining. And it's uh, more of the movie, not not based off the book uh, in this adaptation. And then it flashes forward to when Danny's in his 30s. And this evil force is trying to take the souls or the, the special power from all the people that shine. And so he has to figure out how to stay away from them and help protect the other people that shine as well. And there's particularly one person that has a, the biggest shine anyone's seen. So, you know, trying to protect it from getting eaten and all the shining going away. Is his last name Skywalker? No, his, <laughs> no it's Danny Torrance. It's still, or he goes by Dan now because he's older. Mm. He's his midi chlorian th- level is very high. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Scatman Crothers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so it's weird about the movies because like Scatman Crothers, so they did, like I said, when I was setting it up, they did pay uh, tribute to a lot of the shining, original Shining films. So, But not in that James Dean way they're doing, right? It was like they, they recast the they actors. They recasted it. Like they re- hey, what a clue, Hollywood. That's they, the right way to do this. They rebuilt sets. Uh, I think they only used, they used a couple shots, like the, you know, the over the, the water shot, but they, did, they made it night for day or day for what night. What are you talking about? At the beginning of the movie? Yeah, they, they did a the co- airplane shot when they're driving yeah. up the, with a station wagon. They're, it's following up the mountains. Yeah, so that, but other than that, they recreated the sets, they recreated the scenes, and the actors look pretty damn close, you damn. know? You know, they like the Jack Nicholson esque uh, character. I mean, didn't have didn't talk like Nicholson, but kind of looked like Nicholson. But yeah. it worked, right? And it, it peppered in the original stuff in between when it's explaining it. What, Shelley Duvall? Uh, there was a Shelley Duvall type person. Uh, Danny, I, too? Uh, like young, young Danny, little young Danny. Yeah, they the re- twins. The twins, yeah, they were a Grady. Um, Nobody stuck out. You were like, that's not a good one. No, they did a great job of that. I was wow. so surprised. In the beginning, I had trouble. I was like, because it wasn't, you know, like a straight on shot. I was like, is that is that the real one? And the sets look great. And it was weird the way it was shot. The color, I, like, I guess the, I was reading that the that the director didn't really like the uh, the the Kubrick version of it and like the book better. Like it sided with Stephen King on the details, but he but he wanted to you know, pay tribute to what Kubrick did. Where do you come down on that argument? Uh, so reading, I've read, I've actually read the book and, uh, and yeah. Okay. And I've, and just I, like you read the fountainhead. I didn't read all of it. I admit that I had it next to my bedside. That's reading osmosis. Uh, but I, so I, I dude, I love the shining. It's one of my favorite movies. It's my probably book be, or movie. I go movie. I go okay. movie. I uh, read after reading the book, the book has more details, but it's a lot of shit you don't need either. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, why I go movie because Kubrick's, one of my favorite directors, if not my favorite director of all time. And I've seen the TV movie yeah. in the 90s <laughs> starring Steven Weber and all the unnecessary shit that Kubrick changed or cut out. Watch that one and you won't deem it unnecessary ever again. Oh, of course Holy not. cow, that movie, that TV movie is pretty rough. Yeah. But it is rough, but man. But it's kind of good, bad, like in Ugh. that cheese, you know, like it's Yeah, I mean, fun it's to, fun, fun to, to watch because you're like, it's still The Shining. Yeah. And let's see how bad this gets. <laughs> but this movie, Dr. Sleep, why do they call it Dr. Sleep? 
Uh, because the two reasons the 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 people trying to steal the souls put people to sleep and then tor- torture them to get their There's people that want to steal souls. Yeah, the shine. That's oh, the, how they, the thing. They, yeah, they want to live forever. And oh, so. okay, so everybody that was at like the Overlook Hotel, those were all people that wanted to. That you they, find, were the, they were the shine. Yeah, they were the shine, and they wanted to feed and keep their souls going. And you find that you know you. Something with Pennywise though, doesn't it? All this. Oh, it, it, all his stuff kind of from what I was reading, interconnect. Yeah. So like the uh, Dark Towers, that movie, some stuff's in here. Yeah. Everybody's I forgetting. wanted the Dark Tower movie to be way better than it was. Yeah, I remember. We, Idris Elba. Yeah. I still haven't seen, I haven't watched it yet, but. Uh, uh, yeah. You can skip that so, one. So, I mean, in this one, you got like Ewan McGregor. He play he plays like the old Danny. Um, Rebecca Ferguson oh, plays. Oh, yeah, Ewan McGregor. <laughs> plays like the, uh, the, 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 the female soul sucker. So mm-hmm. much to see. So yeah. much to say. Um, it was more of a, a thriller, more psychological, hmm. you know. So it, I mean, there was some gore in it, and some some violence and things like that. So it was like a horror esque movie what, in that I, way. I, I, what's the actual plot of it besides the shine? People want to steal everybody's souls and stuff. I mean, what what is Ewan McGregor doing in the movie? What what is, what does he do from the beginning to the end? What's what's he running against or fighting against or overcoming? He's trying to protect this girl who connected with him through through the shine. Okay, so. What did you? What do you think the best part about it was? The the style of the movie, the tone of the movie, and the look and feel of it. It did put me back in that place of The Shining. So I think that was the, the movie book. or the book. Uh, the movie. You gotta say, man. The movie of the um, yeah, the movie. Do you think I would like this movie, yeah, Doctor Sleep? Yeah, I think you would. I, yeah, uh, yeah, I think you would. Mm-hmm. It completes the story of what happened to Danny, right? So yeah. so it, it's nice in that end to kind of to kind of bookend it with that. Cool. Well, uh, okay, I just don't like the idea of letting you shine me. Oh, I'm giving you a shine. I'm going to tell you if you like this movie or not. That's my job. Okay, well, watch the movie. I know you wanted to go see it, and I. It, so it's funny because like it was almost. It was like if it was just I don't know a little bit of a tighter movie. I think it would. Be, it, I think it would be a film instead of a movie. Oh wow! Big I, words, big words I from Andy it. today. I liked it. I liked it a lot, man. Oh, okay, that's cool. And Ewan, I love Ewan McGregor. So fantastic in it. Favorite Ewan McGregor performance ever. What is it? Oh, it was a uh, Train Spotting. No, that's only the first one you've seen, because you can't think of any other ones. Okay, like all the Star Wars. Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> um, he was in the. He Win- was great in Star Wars. What are you talking the about? The Winnie the Pooh movie. He was okay. He was fine. He's- See, you have such a bad memory for for movie facts and stuff. You went from the first movie he did to Star Wars to Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> what are you? What are you doing? Like you Make diminished better this, choices. You you diminish this man's career down to like terrible choices. Hey, that's what sticks out in my mind. Fuck you. Make better choices. Okay, you know what my my favorite is, and then we'll get out of here. Okay, Train Spotting. All right. Thank you very much, I everybody. Said that. Hey, excuse me. I'm doing the outro. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. The Four Scenes of Film will continue next week with another exciting episode. Check us out at fourscenesoffilm.com for all your podcasting and filmmaking needs. Get all your social media links there. You can donate to our Patreon page. I want to thank Andy Pesha for also being here. Have a great night, everybody. First three P is in the books. I think we did good. I thought we did it spectacular. Three parts. Andy, take us out on this week in Brolin. I really want to hear that from you this week. Usually we can we go back and forth with uh, who does the better, Josh Brolin. I think Andy has more air inside of him this week. So, what you, um, <laughs> what's that even supposed to mean? <laughs> this week on Brolin, where we uh, we take Josh Brolin's Instagram uh, posts and we read them out loud because when only read off Instagram inside your own mind, you just don't capture the essence of the, how brilliant this man is. As Andy is reading this, thank you very much again. Keep film alive and picture in your mind a picture of Josh Brolin's toilet because that's the picture that he posted this week on Brolin. I'm just going to say it. We used someone to help us furnish our home. I admit it. He excels in style, but I can't say he's got his head around scale. This toilet is a great choice to potty train a one-year-old. But if you look at the sink next to it, for a 205-pound dude, it's basically a test to see if I'll first break this itty-bitty toilet, then, secondly, shit all over the floor. The poopery on the toilet shelf. It's to spray on my face. (laughs) I can't even get through this shit. This shit is such fucking drivel. (laughs) The poop, the poopery on the toilet shelf is to spray my face. The poopery on the toilet shelf is to spray on my face. To help with evil thoughts that pass through my mind. As I overwhelm once again, this little baby toilet that we paid top dollar for. There, I said it.